Welcome to You've Got This with Sarah Hamaker, a podcast to encourage and equip moms along their parenting journey. Join Sarah each week as she interviews dads and moms like you and discusses the joys, challenges, and rewards of raising kids. Hi, and welcome to this week's You've Got This. I'm your host, Sarah Hamaker, and today I have with me David Carey. He and his wife, Valerie, and their son, Trenton, have two decades of pediatric hospital experience from the standpoint of the customer. Their son received a heart transplant just before his first birthday. He was diagnosed with cancer during his senior year of high school, and he had a second heart transplant while in college. Over all those years, David and his family learned to navigate the hospital, the system, and keep their family together as well. So I am happy to have David with me, and we're going to talk about health challenges and kids today. So Great. welcome. Thank you. Now, um, not every family um, is going to go through all that your family went through, but we all have those little health challenges with our kids, whether it's, um, you know, they're sick all the time um, or they break a bone or something like that. How did you kind of, um, what kind of framework did you come to in your mind as you kind of dealt with all of Trenton's um, health issues? Well, you know, for us, it was, I, I don't know if you could say it was easy, but we, we didn't have any choice. You know, when he was 11 months old, he was his heart was uh, he basically gave up the strength to breathe while we were in the ER. So it was just a a desperation kind of you, you got to save your kid. And so from day one, almost we we didn't really have a choice. And uh, so, but as as time goes time goes by, what we did find was interesting was um, you got me thinking about kind of the comparison of ourselves to other families and what they've gone through you know like when families you know some people say to me uh yeah you know i had my kid got his tonsils out and it was the hardest time for us being in the hospital was nothing like you guys went through Mm. and i have to tell them you know it doesn't matter when it's your kid in the hospital especially if it's the first time it's uh it's tough and uh we've just had the the uh, opportunity if you will to have had a lot of experience to build up our our experience around it. Yeah, I I like that because so often um, we do that comparison uh, with other families, whether it's, you know, grades or health issues or, and we think that we have to minimize what we're going through. Um, but, But I think we can keep it, you know, we can keep it real in our family and realize that, yes, we may not have your family situations, but we have our own. And to kind of remember that, um, you know, God has given us our own family to take care of um, and try to avoid that comparison. I must That must have been hard, though, to not compare with other families. You know, that was something I found out early on. In fact, we do a direct comparison. When Trent was in ICU, uh, there was a kid next door to him, Zach, who was a teenager who had just had a heart transplant. And I noticed, especially Valerie, she would have her ups and downs pulled by how Zach was doing. Mm. And so if Zach was having a tough time, she's thinking, oh, no, that's going to happen to Trent. If, Trent. if Zach had a great time, then she thought, okay, there's hope for Trent. And uh, I looked at it like an ocean. I thought, you know what, I've I've got to just kind of ride the waves and the waves get up don't get too excited uh, uh and when the waves get down too low don't let it pull you down too far but yeah you it's easy to do that we have i don't know if you, you remember those uh oh gosh it was successories mm-hmm. things a while back all these motivational things there was some demotivators that came out a while back kind of making fun of the accessories and there was one of a a, a big ship on end as it was sinking about halfway down and it said some people are uh, are just an example seem like they're just an example for other people and i wrote in one of my blogs one time i think some people may look at us sometimes and say hey it could be worse at least we're not the carries and uh, i'm going <laughs> yeah. but you know what it's it, it's it, we got a good life we got trent we have trent we have a lot of experience and uh learn to deal with it and it's we see people all the time that we look at and we say oh my gosh at least we don't have to deal with that you know, we still have Trent and he's healthy. Right. And I think sometimes um, when we kind of get on that comparison, um, whether it's with health issues, other like, or whether, um, whatever it can be, it can really, I think, make us miss the 
the opportunities in our own family at that moment. If we're always, because that's kind of the grass is greener, right? Oh, well, at least it's not that. Or it could be, um, you know, that type of mentality. And I don't think it's really that healthy. We should, you know, there's a lot of talk about mindfulness, but uh, what I like about that is that we really should be thinking of, uh, you know, what do we have in this moment in our family? Yeah, you know why I, I call it uh, being still thankful. So in spite of life's challenges, I'm still thankful. That's the, the blog that I started. Mm-hmm. And the thought on that being I can focus on those difficult times, especially like back when he was a baby. And we thought it's no fair. And we thought we had lost him at one point for about nine minutes. And I thought I haven't had my chance with him. I haven't had a turn. This is no fair. And uh, we did get through that. You know, he, he obviously he survived and did great. But along the way, I looked back and I realized, you know what? God put so many people there in incredible positions to to save us and carry us and, and um, um, just be of, of service to us. That if we hadn't gone through those challenges. I wouldn't have had those friends stepping up and showing how much they they cared for us and cared about us. Yeah, and I think that that thankful heart, that that heart of gratitude. I mean, isn't that what we all really want for us and for our kids? Is to help cultivate that, no matter what life looks like. Yeah, you know we want that, but we also want it to be an easy life. Yes. <laughs> yeah. we, want, we want the big man on campus that gets all the straight A's and that, you know knows, does his, all his homework and never gets in trouble and all that. But you know what? What kind of uh, in in the end, uh, probably some of the most meaningful lives are those that have the most challenges along the way. Yeah, and I think that, and along with that, the um, the idea that we can protect our kids. From all that, you know, stuff out there in life, whether it's health issues or mental issues or, you know, fill in the blank. We think that we have this ability to, you know, protect our kids from it. Um, And we really, you know, then something comes along, we realize we really don't have that ability. Right. We hear you hear a lot of the world talking about how, you know, uh, you can control your own life. It's all up to you. And yeah, I thoroughly believe that we are responsible for ourselves. But in the end, there's so many things that happen to us that are out of our control that when you get to that point, in fact, we had a discussion about this when he was in the hospital as a baby. Some of the men from our Sunday school came and we talked about that issue of does God give you more than you can handle? And I came to the conclusion that no, God does not give you bad stuff. If he's the perfect father, he's not going to give you bad stuff. He already knows the world has enough evil in it, and he will allow that to happen. But he will then put people around you to uh, to take care of you and get you through it, we, even though it, it would be more than you could handle on your own. And with our kids, it's we want to we want to be able to protect our kids and uh, get them to that point where we don't ever have to worry about them, that they don't ever have bad stuff. But, you know, it's some of those challenges along the way are some of the best character builders for them. Because of all what we've gone through, because of what Trenton has gone through and what Valerie and I have gone through, it's now prepared the three of us to where we should be able to help other families in that situation too. Yeah, and I think that when we when we start with that protecting our kids from everything – we do kind of rob them of that opportunity to meet those challenges and that build that resilience yeah. to, you know, because they're going to fail in something. And I would rather them learn how to handle that and how to overcome that while they're still young and in my home than to send them out into the world having, you know, protected them or that being that snowplow parent we've heard so much about lately, you know, smoothing all the way. And so when they get on their own, they fall apart. Yeah, I've got two stories for you on that. So my older one, Austin, was all, I think I helped him with one homework assignment in his life. And mm-hmm. he's, he's now a CPA, grown and doing well. But when he was about in fifth grade, the best grade he ever got, that, I, that my favorite grade of his was a B. He, was, he always did his homework. He was a great student. And he didn't want to fail. And so he was ended up cheating on a test and was caught and mm-hmm. given a zero. And the the teacher told him, you know, you're just so smart. If you do enough extra credit, you, you might be able to get back that back up to an A. 
So he did everything he could, all the extra credit, and he ended up with a B. And I said, you know, look at that, Austin. You knew the stuff. You didn't have to cheat. If you had just tried your best and not cheated, you probably would have already ended up with an A. And so out of all the A's he's gotten in his life, that B was my favorite mm-hmm. grade. With Trenton, it was, and this would be a, a, you know, a good lesson for the really young parents that, that are just, if you've gone through something like we have where you've, you've been close to losing your child and you, you don't know, you know what tomorrow looks like. When Trent, so Trent was transplanted, it was his first heart transplant right before his first birthday. And so by three years old, when he's able to get into learn about mischief, and uh, I noticed Valerie was not disciplining him the way we both agreed that the kid should be uh, disciplined. And I confronted her about it. And after all this time since the transplant, this was the first time she ever said it out loud. You know, she was trying to not cry. She said, I, I don't know how long I have him. And I said, you know what? I don't either. So I have to assume I'm going to have him a long time and I'm not going to raise a jerk. Mm. And so you have to, you don't know if he's going to, you know, what's going to happen tomorrow. But at the same time, you got to be thinking about, you you have to think out decades into the future and how do you keep moving on and raise the kid like we did our other two kids that, you know, assume he's going to be a, a, you know, good self, uh, uh, responsible, uh, independent adult at some point. I, I love that, David, because that's what I encourage all my parents that I uh, coach and that I talk to um, and myself as well, is that, yeah, we are raising adults. And none of us know how long we're going to have our kids. I mean, we may not, uh, so our families may not have some of the health issues that your family went through with Trent, but we also have no guarantee Right. I mean, we don't know how long each of us is going to be on Earth. And but we do need to have that long term goal. I always encourage parents to develop a parental vision for their kids. What do they want that child to be at age 30? Think to the future. And so that it does help when you want your child to be hardworking, for example, at age 30, well, then you're going to make sure that they do their chores, right? (laughs) There are things that you're going to do now with that eye on the future. And I think it's very helpful when we project in the future what we want our child to be, because it gives us the energy and the desire um, and the consistency to do the hard work, especially when they're young. You know, raising kids to me is just uh, like helping anybody, any friends out there. There's two ways. There's the triage and then there's a the long-term cure. Mm. And the triage is essential in terms of giving them things in the early stages to stabilize them, whatever it may be. And, you know, the basics for the kids are food and shelter and some of the basics of, of uh, uh, being a decent member of society. But that's just the long, that's just the short term. Over the long term, yeah, you have to be thinking. It's a great way you, you, that you put it there. You have to be thinking out, you know, decades into the future, and what's the long term solution? And the long term solution is definitely not the uh, is not g- continuously giving them things. It's it's teaching them to be uh, independent. Right, and that and that's um, and that can be difficult in the moment. Um, because it can be hard to, you know, to be that consistent person, um, that consistent mom, that consistent dad with with the dis- discipline. And, and I always remind parents that discipline isn't always about correcting. It's also about, you know, we're making disciples of our children. We want them to have our family values. We want them to, you know, grow up to be productive members of society. So thinking of it as, discipling our children um, as opposed yeah. to disciplining it, I think can be helpful as well. That's a great point. Yeah. And, uh, and for me, I, it's great for me. I, it's easy for me to talk big on a podcast when my kids are not around. <laughs> you know, you get into the trenches with me and there are plenty of mistakes that we make along the way too. Oh, but yeah. as long as you're trying. Right, right. And I, you know, remind parents, you know, and I think about, you know, we all had that moment where we said, well, you know, we're not going to make X mistake that we think our parents made in raising us. <laughs> and oh, I yeah, laugh. You are. Yeah, I laugh about that. I might not make that exact mistake, but I'm going to make plenty of my own. And I just sometimes I think, what are my kids going to say that they didn't like I that I did? 
<laughs> as a parent. I almost can't wait to hear that, you know, 10 years in the future or whatever, when they're all grown and talking about, oh, well, you remember, mom, you did blah, blah, blah. I'm never going to do that with my kids. And I can just laugh because I'm like, you're going to do something else if they're going to talk exactly. about you know, as you put it that way, you got me thinking so the, how great my kids are because my oldest is uh, 28, Trent is 25, and Allison is 21. And when they tell me, uh, when we reminisce on things, what's so great is they never bring up all the mistakes that I've made that they yeah. now realize I've made. So yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. Um, that That's great. I mean, it's nice that, um, you know, they sound like they have a close relationship with you. And that's really our goal as parents, right? No matter if we're, you know, we may have some challenging um, times. It may be health related. It may be academic related. Um, it could be personality clashes um, that could be a difficult time. Um, but looking to the future and thinking and having that long term can really, I think, help us not to get discouraged. So, uh, you know, how did you and your wife, you know, try not to get discouraged with all the different things that you went through with Trent? We did. You I, did, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, let's see, he, obviously, anyone would, would get discouraged when you have your baby lying there in intensive care and you don't know if he's going to mm. gonna make it. He made it. He survived. He had, he had a uh, really good life. And because of the meds that he takes, the anti, uh, the immunosuppressants, mm. when he was a senior in high school, this is when he was diagnosed with cancer. And it was, in fact, it first started showing the hints the night he tested for his second degree black belt in Taekwondo. Mm. And it was a few weeks later when we got the diagnosis. And I just remember thinking to myself, you've got to be kidding me, God. Not again. He has had his turn. Right. <clears throat> you know, it's just not fair. We can't be going through this again. And, uh, but, you know, a, a few, few days later, we figured out, you know, you got no choice. You just have to, just have to go through it. Right. And, and I think that, I mean, it can be easy, I think, to say, oh, yeah, of course you can. But when you're in the moment, you know, I think faith, it plays, a probably played, a, you know, sounds like it played a large part in your, Ability to still be thankful, like your blog says, right? To still be grateful for um, for the life that God gave you. Yeah, it was. You know, I think a lot of people, uh, especially those who don't have faith, l- look at our story and think that it's totally backwards. How how can you have faith after all that you've gone through? And I look back and say, there are so many signs of how our faith got us through it and it was because of our faith and, it, and it's it's not because of our faith that i know trenton's all never going to die we mm-hmm. all die and a lot of you know a lot of christians they die in in bad, bad ways that has nothing to do with it we all know it, it's going to happen at some point but when you again when you pay attention to when you have faith and you understand uh how God works and how he uses his people to to do his work for him here on earth, that's where you can look back and say, wow, it's, it's incredible. I, when Trent was in the hospital the first time as a baby, I noticed later on that it was if it was not our family, it was our church friends who were mm-hmm. e- everywhere. I'm talking about everywhere. Before we ever got up to ICU on the first day, uh, one of our ministers was already waiting. We hadn't told anybody. Mm-hmm. But we stepped off the elevator, and he's already waiting for us. So we're going, wait, wait, how did you even know we're here? We haven't had a chance to call anyone. Well, our church was so big at the time, they had the, divided the group into what they call care clusters. And the people who ran our care cluster just happened to be volunteering at the hospital that day. Mm-hmm. Just happened to see our name on the list in the emergency room, called the hospital, and I mean, called the uh, church, and our minister was there waiting for us. And a couple days later, when we were having a, a tough time, uh, a uh, woman walked into the, our room in ICU, and she was wearing scrubs, introduced herself. Her name's Kathy. She's the head nurse uh, on in ICU. Just want to let you know we're going to do everything we can to take care of you. And, oh, by the way, I'm a member of Park City's Presbyterian Church like you are. And all along the way, they just kept coming out of the woodwork. When people, When we needed help, it was someone from Park City's Presbyterian who mm. stepped in. Even in the operating room, three surgeons, one of them had just happened to be a member of our church. 
And so there was never a time, even in the operating room, when Trenton didn't have someone from our church around him. So it was interesting how, you know, that God will put people in place to take care of you. He hand-selected people directly from our church that whole that whole time. I That is, that I mean, that is such a beautiful picture of how God takes care of his family and his children. So to take it a step further, uh, a few years later, when we were when uh, we were pregnant again, people asked, "Well, you have a lot of guts. How could you do that with with what you went through with Trent?" And we said, "Well, how could we not? When you look at how God got us through that the first time, you got to take a chance on this on this one. And if I hadn't, I would not have gotten my daughter. And I've I've, I've said for years, little girls are one of the best things God ever made. And so, <laughs> you know, because of that, and uh, just realizing that it wasn't." Because of God that we got through, the, that we were, had tough times. It was because of God that we got through them. That uh, yeah, He got me my got me my sweetie. Yeah. Well, that is a great way to wrap up um, our our time together today, David. Uh, you have been listening to You've Got This with Sarah Hamricker. I've been talking with David Carey, um, who has a blog on called Still Thankful, and I hope you'll check that out because he has a lot to be thankful for, and I know that you will too. I hope you join me next week. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for listening to this week's podcast of You've Got This with Sarah Hamaker. Sign up to receive notification of new podcasts and listen to previous editions at sarahhamaker.com. Until next time, remember, parenting might be hard sometimes, but don't worry, you've got this.